few things, so you can help me out if you like, and please feel comfortable. This session is for you to help you understand some issues in Indigenous governance. And I've pulled together some slides and primarily just pulled from stuff that I've already presented, mostly to law students. Um, and, you know, I, I expect that st law students sometimes have a bit of a different understanding of, you know, um, different issues. So uh, what I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is please feel free to ask questions uh, as we go, right? Just raise your hand and, like, we can also have question period after, but really appreciate and um, um, really welcome you to just say, like, I'm not sure about this. What does this mean? Or if you're just not clear on something, please. Because it's a, as you can gather from the last panel, uh, these are complex issues. And uh, this is not going to, uh, this uh, probably will not make anything much clearer for you. It will show you that there is a like, real deep complexity to issues around Indigenous governance. Um, but at least you'll have a sense of the complexity, perhaps better than you do now. So I'll start with a few um, I will start with a few key concepts um, that I think are helpful um, to start. So, uh, three. So the first one is this concept of self-determination, um, which uh, is a concept that comes from international law, and it's this idea that um, peop a people should have the right to choose their destiny. So it's about choice, primarily. Um, and, and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, was, which was a major uh, national inquiry that happened in the mid-1990s, uh, um, said that in Canada, what self-determination means is that for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, that they have the right to negotiate the terms of their relationship with Canada and choose governmental structures that meet their needs. And as I said in response, I think, to the question that I got earlier that that might look different depending on what uh, nation we're talking about. So for the Mi'kmaq of New Brunswick, that may me look different than the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, for example. And it's not a either or flick a switch and completely uh, uh, um, uh, autonomous governance, but rather it can be a whole range of activities. Um, so it can look very different, but the term self-government is related to the, the concept of self-determination, and that refers to uh, specifically uh, where a, uh, a nation is able to enforce its own rules, uh, resolve its own disputes and problem solve, and establish its own governing institutions to carry out the task of governing. And First Nations, many do aspire to self-governance. But that's not to mean that they would be wholly and totally autonomous from the rest of Canada. We have, as I said, various governments who work together in Canada, and that still is going to have to happen. Um, and so, you know, uh, what self-government looks like, we, don't, we haven't really seen quite a bit of it yet. I'll come more to that later. Um, but it can take a variety of forms. Um, what we have a lot of, and this builds on the last lecture, is what's called self-administration. Um, so that's where programs and services can be delivered by indigenous groups, but all the other, but other governments make the key decisions with respect to it. So primarily with respect to child welfare and with respect to other services, um, First Nations are in a self-administration regime. Uh, I only mentioned briefly that there are funding agreements and this sort of move to self-administration actually happened in the 80s and 90s. It was a, uh, it was primarily the, um, it was happening a bit before in the 80s, um, but it was really under the Mulroney government that it really took off. And uh, uh, Mulroney spoke about, um, and his cabinet spoke about, um, Self-administration kind of being like on a spectrum of self-government, where at first you start off by taking over the services, although other governments call the shots, but then you might get to uh, the other side of it where there would be a more autonomous self-government. And the idea was that by starting here, it would be a, um, a jumping off point or a uh, sort of a staggered approach to finally get to self-government. But we've really stalled. Uh, in the last 30 years and actually moving further. And um, coming back again to the presentation we just had, I argue um, that it's because of underfunding and, and the structure of how self-administration is, is currently structured that we're not moving further at all. And actually, because of that, we're, we're regressing. But uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. But let, let me continue. All right, so continuing on with our key concepts. First of all, any, any questions on those three first key concepts? Okay, all right. 
So let's move to these two. We're not going to get into them as much, um, but uh, I will touch on them on, on a little bit, and I do think they're important. Um, I, I talk about Aboriginal law. Uh, when I do, I, uh, what I'm referencing is actually Canadian law as it applies to Indigenous people. So we have Section 35 of the Constitution um, that talks about the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights. Um, we have concepts like the duty to consult and fiduciary duty. Those would be, to me, examples of Aboriginal law. We also have this uh, concept that is evolving called Indigenous law, which is actually a reference to the laws and the customs and traditions of indigenous governments, of indigenous peoples. Um, and there is starting to be a revival of this, uh, a whole movement as, uh, um, that is happening. And I hope to have a chance to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So those are those two concepts. Next is terminology. Um, People struggle with this, and as you can, as you heard Cindy's comment, she said it a couple times. You know, different people uh, use different uh, terminology, and sometimes I have students that are, you know, almost tied in knots about, well, I don't know what language to use. And a, a good rule of thumb, if you're actually uh, engaging with um, a First Nation or a Mi'kmaq or an Indigenous person, is to just ask them what terminology they prefer, because they will they will let you know. But to sort of give you the um, the sort of technical definitions of some of these, some of them are legal terms, um, or at least related to, uh, um, so for example, indigenous is a term that's begun to be used uh, primarily um, in the international field, and now it has become, become to be used a lot in Canada. So we do hear people use the term indigenous, and it is supposed to be this sort of homogenizing concept of like indigenous people. It's broad and inclusive, and it refers to things like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is a reference to the descendants of original peoples of places. Um, some people don't like it, as Cindy says, because it does sort of add this gloss, and for some people who know nothing about the area, they just assume that all these people that this term refers to are the same and have the same needs and same issues. And so that, I think that's part of the concern with using such a broad term. But um, nonetheless, it, it, it is a, a term that is used frequently. Another term that's uh, similar is Aboriginal. Uh, again, it's another sort of broad, inclusive term. That term's actually defined in our Constitution. Um, and it refers to the Inuit, Métis, and Indians. Um, most people say First Nations today. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a reference to those three. Again, suffers a little bit from the same problem as being sort of a homogenizing term, um, but can be helpful when referring to the original peoples or the descendants of the original peoples. Um, and then we have uh, three more specific terms. Um, the reference to Inuit is the de descendants of the original inhabitants of the north. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about them shortly. Also, the term Métis refers to persons of mixed European um, or First Nation or Inuit culture, but that also developed uh, their own distinct language and culture. A lot of people, a lot of my students, um, often think that Métis simply means mixed, mixed origin, right? A mixed ancestry. Uh, and so a good family friend, who was a great friend of my father's, uh, knows that I am Mi'kmaq, knew my father, who was Mi'kmaq, and then once introduced me to somebody as, like, uh, possibly Canada's first Métis judge. And I, <laughs> and I said, no, I'm, I'm actually not Métis. Where did you ever get that idea? So um, it, you know, in fact, there was a Supreme Court of Canada decision from 2004 um, where... Uh, the court explained that Métis actually means a uh, sort of coming together of two cultures. Usually it was, um, in, you know, historical communities like the, during the time of the fur trade, um, mix, uh, so a mix of European and indigenous cultures that came together to create a new culture with their own distinct language, uh, referred to as Michif, and so not simply just of mixed origin, but actually uh, a, a historical sort of mixing that actually created a new culture. Finally, there's the term First Nations, which we use a lot. I probably said it probably 50 times already today. Um, but again, it, it is also in itself a homogenizing term. Um, it replaced the term Indian, which is still also used in law. We still have the Indian Act. 
Um, and that is, uh, you know, thought to be an anachronism. You know, uh, when explorers came here, C Christopher Columbus was looking for a trade route to India and so got confused and the first brown people he saw he thought were Indians, uh, but they weren't, but the term stuck. Um, in more recent years, we are using the term First Nations, but really that is actually in reference to about 50 different distinct cultures, right, that have different languages, different cultures, different legal systems. Um, and so, yeah, even that term itself can be somewhat problematic because it is uh, homogenizing a bunch of different cultures into one. So uh, the, individu or the, the individual groups that make up the term First Nations include Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Mohawk, Cree, Anishinaabe, which I could go on and on, but I won't go through the whole list. Um, but those are some of, some of the key terminology that we hear. Before I move on from that, is, is there any terminology questions? We're good? You guys know all this stuff already? Maybe? Some of it? No? Okay. So now let's get into this next question. We've, I've sort of given you a brief introduction to the different terminology. So uh, with respect to governance, who are indigenous decision makers or lawmakers? So we'll start with the Inuit. Um, the, who make up 53 different communities across the north. Um, the history of the Inuit is interesting. For a very long time, the federal government uh, denied that it had any uh, responsibility to, um, uh, with respect to the Inuit. And that came to a head in 1939 when the Supreme Court of Canada uh, decided that indeed um, there is a constitutional provision in our Constitution, uh, Section 9124, that says that the federal government has exclusive legislative jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Um, and for a long time, the federal government simply took the position that it only had a responsibility to Indians living on reserves. Um, but that has been slowly, uh, over time, challenged and is no longer the case. But the Inuit, um, it, this, this issue finally came to a head in a case involving Quebec and, um, and Canada over who had responsibility over the Inuit. And so finally, this 1939 case called Re-Eskimo, um, in fact, did decide that Inuit are a responsibility of the federal government. So at that time, the federal government decided it wasn't going to add in the Inuit to the Indian Act, which had been in existence since the 1800s, uh, 1876, but instead, via policy, started um, delivering similar, somewhat of the similar services that uh, were delivered to um, First Nations. But then in the 70s, I'm glossing over lots of parts of history, but in the 70s there was a whole, in reaction to the 1969 white paper, hands, those of you who have heard of the white paper? Okay, so Canada's response to or attempt to sort of assimilate First Nations and get rid of any sort of special rights, uh, as they called it, um, which fueled a, an indigenous resistance um, and as part, of, as, as part and parcel of that resistance, indigenous people went to the courts and uh, one of the major lawsuits that happened in the mid 70s involved um, Inuit and uh, that, that in, in, from Quebec and that eventually uh, in the mid, seven, in mid 70s led to the first land, modern land claim treaty or agreement, the, uh, the James Bay, um, the James Bay Agreement uh, in northern Quebec. And since that time, Canada has um, negotiated uh, self-government agreements with um, four of the major um, uh, Inuit uh, regions um, in the north. So you can see on your list, so we've got um, Nunavut, uh, Inu Inuvialuit, uh, Nunavik, and the um, Nunatsiavut. So uh, Canada has concluded um, land claim agreements, some of which include some self-government provisions in them. Uh, primarily the Nunatsiavit agreement has uh, self-government provisions in them. Um, yeah, so the Inuit actually stand in a quite of a different position to, uh, to First Nations in some respects because most of them have these modern treaties. We can come back to that at the end, but just know that, yeah, the Inuit in Canada, all except for one group uh, in Labrador have signed a, uh, a, a land claim agreement with Canada. So under 
uh, these agreements, there can be certain bodies that are created. Uh, the Nunatsiavut it government, um, in fact, uh, has a constitution and a variety of departments and a legislative assembly. And under the various agreements, there are uh, bodies that are created. Uh, Nunavut is the only one that's slightly different. Um, they didn't um, conclude an agreement that was specifically with an indigenous body. Um, the agreement was to form a public government, so a, a third territory. So slightly different, but uh, the Nunavut, uh, the, the territory of Nunavut is 85% Inuit, and so they still nonetheless have significant decision-making power. So we can come back to that, but let's finish looking at our, our overall picture. All right, let's talk about the Métis now. So like the Inuit, the, uh, the federal government, and Cindy alluded to this, um, for the longest time have been fighting for recognition from the federal government, who, who for the longest time have said, you're not our responsibility, you're a responsibility of uh, the provincial government. Um, so uh, in the last census, we have uh, close to 500,000 people who self-identify as Métis. Those numbers tend to be growing. Um, and um, back to this question of jurisdiction. So for a long time, there are historic Métis communities in several parts of Canada. One of the most, you know, the prairies is where we see um, the most uh, populations with, uh, um, you know, who have uh, long-standing claims to Métis identity. Um, and so in some places like Alberta, the, f the provincial governments have actually stepped up and, and recognized Métis claims. So in Alberta, uh, we have Métis uh, settlement um, legislation in place uh, that's been in place for some time um, that actually sets out um, settlement lands that, that the Métis live on and uh, settlement councils who exercise decision-making power. Um, but Alberta is the only province um, that uh, has such uh, legislation, even in other provinces like Saskatchewan um, and Manitoba, although there are significant Métis populations, there hasn't been that level of recognition um, as Alberta has. There's one modern land claim agreement um, with the, the Métis in, in Northwest Territories, and that is an agreement that's also signed with the Dene. Um, but uh, for a very long time, the um, federal government has denied any obligation until very recently to negotiate with the Métis. Um, some of that has changed. In 2016, the Supreme Court of Canada decided, kind of just like in the Inuit case, that the federal government does have jurisdiction under its jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians to Métis. Um, and... Uh, in the current administration, there has in fact been some more negotiation. So just doing a little update from my slide, um, as of June, there was an announcement of, um, in June of this year where Canada did sign uh, some limited self-government agreements with different Métis organizations. So there was a big announcement about a signing with the Métis of Ontario, the Métis of Alberta, and the Métis of Saskatchewan. And these agreements were not expansive agreements. They covered uh, some rights of, of self-determination over citizenship, um, leadership selection, and governmental operations and language. And they said that, there, but they also created a mechanism to further negotiate governance over other areas as well. But some developments in the Métis context. All right. How are we doing so far? Questions? All right. No, we're good over here. Okay. Um, so now let's turn to First Nations, which um, what we're talking about here are people who are recognized under uh, the Indian Act. As I said before, the term First Nations is, is used. There's a whole history that I'm going to bracket about the Indian Act and who it defines as being Indian, and it's a long history of it being discriminatory, and there still continues to be some issues. People have lost their Indian status, they, so they sort of... Um, self-identify as being non-status um, First Nations. And so there are some issues around that. I'm sort of glossing over them. Um, but uh, just to flag that it is a, an issue as well and, and does um, inform some of the, the uh, complex issues that First Nations face. Um, but moving aside from that, because I can't cover everything, uh, I will say that, so with the term First Nations, um, 
tends to be seen as actually meaning First Nations bands under the Indian Act. And although, as I said earlier, there, you know, uh, traditionally or historically were about 50 to 70 different nations uh, in Canada, including the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, other groups, through the process of the Indian Act, these, all these nations got splintered up into little groups, right? So we have, we are in Mi'kmaq territory. How, how much expanse, how far is, is Mi'kmaq territory only for Nova Scotia? Where else, what else is covered by? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Also, Gas Bay, where I'm from, and, and the US as well. Yeah, so um, very good. Um, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, o over time, our communities have been splintered into these bands. And, um, that, and that really informs the complexity of the issues around governance as well. So the Indian Act, um, uh, in fact, sort of uh, provided a mechanism whereby the federal government could completely dissolve whatever traditional form of social organization and political organization that bands had could divvy them up into small groups and, and place them on certain lands, reserves. And then uh, the, the act provided that um, the, whatever form of traditional governance existed would be replaced by a chief and council system. So having anywhere from two to 12 council, elected councillors um, and, and a chief. Um, and for a long period of time, the Indian Act provided that only males over age 21 could be elected, so there's issues of uh, uh, patriar uh, um, patriarchy uh, as well going on there. And so this system that allowed for the sort of parceling up into these little bands still exists with us and complicates the picture in a variety of ways because some people think that there's actually 617 nations in Canada, right? But in fact, um, you actually, th these, are, these are, you know, parcels of a, a larger nation. But the law tends to see often the band as like the, the governance unit. Um, and that creates lots of challenges for First Nations because that was not a decision of their choosing. And, um, you know, and, and there's other sort of arbitrary distinctions like the provincial distinctions, right? So here we have 13 Mi'kmaq bands in Nova Scotia, but there's about 32 Mi'kmaq bands throughout the, the territory in Canada. You had a question? Mm -hmm. going to a particular nation, what they're really talking about is a particular band as part of the larger nation overall, I and mean, is that one of the complexities that we need? Absolutely, yeah. So you could have, you know, an, within a whole, a nation, um, yes, one band who, or 10 who say yay for a project and then two who may say nay, right? And, and how, does, how does that get addressed? So that is a problem. And then sometimes you may have all of the uh, elected band councils being for something, but then the grassroots individuals, the people on the ground say, um, we're not for that particular proposal, be it a pipeline or what have you. So this adds to that complexity because a lot of grassroots people in Indigenous communities actually um, think that band governance are problematic, that they are in fact not the traditional form of government, but really are almost, um, you know, a colonial institution, right? They're created by the department uh, or b by the Indian Act. I think it's, it, it is, it is a, a really complex issue. I don't think it's black and white. It is rather that um, I, I've worked with many, many band council chiefs and they are very restrained sometimes uh, in what they can do. Um, and, you know, there, sometimes their community members don't appreciate how constrained they, they may well be. And they tend to, not always, nobody is perfect, but they tend to be doing it with, the, you know, trying to help their people. But at the same time, there are, uh, you know, often very legitimate critiques that can be made about, you know, the, the role of band council. So it adds to a very complex picture. And sometimes what happens these days in, in consultation, because consultation is a legal requirement under the Constitution, there is this, this debate. So if a government went and consulted with the five bands who are affected by a decision, is that sufficient? What if the rest of, or a significant chunk of the population, the grassroots, let's say, are not in favor of it? How do, 
How do we mediate that? And is it up to the federal government or provincial governments to mediate that, or is it a governance issue that we internally have to address? Anyway, so th these are challenges, for sure. So we're still, by and large, in that Indian Act Band Council system. There are some communities that have signed self-government agreements. I've got some examples up on the screen. By and large, we have not moved that very far yet. How are we doing for time? We're only going for 2.15 or 2.30? OK, thanks. 15, OK. So yeah, I think I've touched a little bit on some of that. So I might jump around. And I'm happy to give the slides out. Um, so I guess the point I wanted to make with the First Nations is that it, it is, we do have banned governments, but then there are all kinds of other lawmakers or decision makers that are, are possible as well and exist in this complex structure. And even if I cover that, I'll be happy with uh, covering that with you guys. Um, so uh, there are some groups that have never been recognized by the federal government. So there's actually some uh, reserves that were never created. This has actually happened, or some reserves that were never actually counted um, and is never brought under the Indian Act. Um, and so there are people who claim an indigenous identity and who haven't received recognition from the federal government. This happened massively in Newfoundland because of Newfoundland's uh, unique history of when they came into confederation. Um, but anyway, so sometimes what happens is that you have groups who sort of take it into their own hands and have created their own structures. They use corporate, corporate structures to create an entity uh, and they come together. So the Labrador Métis Nation, now called Nunatunavut, um, they profess a, a, an Inuit Métis sort of identity. Uh, they formed a, a corporation called the uh, NCC, the Nunatunavut Community Council, and they assert rights based on that. Uh, and they have gotten more recognition. So it, it just goes to show that you know, there, are, there, are, there are very different ways that groups are getting recognition. Another thing is that despite e even just sticking with First Nations bands, um, bands don't necessarily want to just be working on their own. They would want to work perhaps in concert, especially if they're from a, a similar nation, if they're from the same nation, or perhaps if they all sign the same kind of treaty. So what you also find are uh, bands using the corporate structure to create uh, a body to represent themselves, um, to put forward claims towards governments and others, and have a more united front. So I give the example of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and I'll talk about their structure in a sec. And they, they kind of try to blend traditional forms of government and also this Indian Act form of government. Um, yeah. And courts' decisions um, in the past used to pretty much only just see the Indian Act Ban Council as the, as the authority. But Changes have been happening. There's been court decisions that recognize that, well, first of all, um, that Indigenous people have a right to be able to determine the rep their own representational uh, groupings. Um, slowly but surely, there's been a few court decisions that have has recognized that. So it's not just the ban that is going to necessarily be the authority. We may have other groups working together or even competing for, uh, for say. So uh, ignore that. Uh, box. I don't know how that extra box came in, but this is even just to explain to you the uh, the structure of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. So there's 13 bands in Nova Scotia, um, but for the past, geez, 20 years or so, the 13, and sometimes they go down to 12 and 11 and they come back to the 13. They have their issues sometimes, but they try to work together in order to uh, govern together, at least on some issues. There might be some individual issues for ban, but they actually, and this is a, is, a, is a process that they came up with. It wasn't imposed on them, and they decided that for lots of things, they're going to work together in this way. So, and it's quite sophisticated. So at, at the top, first of all, is the traditional form of Mi'kmaq governance. We have what's called a grand council and a grand chief, and we had different, we had seven districts, um, and we had uh, district, captains or leaders. Um, I don't have too much time to get into it, but just to say that there is a, a grand council, a traditional structure. And so the process that got uh, developed by the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia tried to actually, I don't, don't know if I, oh, I do have a little line on this, actually try to include a part of the traditional structure into the decision-making structure they have here in Nova Scotia. 
So the Grand Chief and the Grand Captain, who are the heads of the Grand Council, have ex officio positions uh, on, uh, in, in, the, in, in the process that has been set up. So basically how it works, at the top of the decision making, we have the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, uh, representing so the 13 elected uh, band chiefs, uh, two ex officio members of the Grand Council who meet monthly. They actually have also, I think, uh, meetings before that leading up to where the two uh, co-chairs kind of decide what's going to go up. Uh, and, you know, trying to work as a collective to address what's coming from the federal government, what's coming from provincial governments, and what can be worked on together. Um, they also have basically their own bureaucracy underneath them as well to help them move that work forward. Um, so they have a uh, means uh, how, do, how do we talk together, how do we work together. They have a negotiation office, but that's basically the bureaucracy. And Angelina, who is here, she works in that office. So she's part of that bureaucracy. And so they provide administrative and research support to the chiefs. Um, they have an executive director who's, who's a lawyer, and they have various lawyers who work for them. Beyond that, they have, there's different negotiation forums. There's the tripartite forum that kind of deals with uh, immediate issues involving culture, economic development, health, justice, social issues. They have a negotiation table where uh, we talk about, uh, they talk about rights and they negotiate Aboriginal tr and treaty rights, uh, issues of self-determination, and they also have a consultation unit. So they've structured their consultation so that instead of every time there's a project that the provincial or federal government want to consult on or have to consult on, they're not going to run to the individual band but rather they start at this office and that office determines how many bands does it affect. Uh, they go to the individual bands affected. Would you like us to negotiate for you as part of, you know, with the, with the resources that we have when you would inform the process? And so they decide whether they're going to go at it as a group versus not. So it's a fairly sophisticated uh, system that is developed. And, and actually, I don't know how many uh, Nova Scotians even those working in government really have a clear idea that in fact uh, there is a, a way to work with Mi'kmaq. And actually, if you go to, this is not only Nova Scotia who has this system, right? There's a, I could point you to a similar sort of charts for how uh, groups in other parts of the country are coming together. And that is, so despite the Indian Act, bands are trying to sort of work in and provide a form of government that, um, that f they feel makes them better accountable and working together more as a group. Any questions on this, on this chart? Yes, no? Yeah. too much a lot of the focus is on um, the problems with the, the Indian Act structure but like looking actual scholarship looking at these and looking at the different models no not as yet no, there's lots of gap areas when it comes to research in indigenous issues there's massive gap areas um, so yeah hasn't happened yet but that would be a great area of study if those of you with doing masters who are interested in, in doing that um, so how, how are we doing now for time? So, okay, five minutes. Let me see what else I can fit in. So that's a little picture of the different govern governance, um, uh, the very sort of nuanced and, and, and different governance structures that we have. I think I could say a few more other things. Um, on, there, there even is more beyond that. I think I've probably thrown enough at you to digest, uh, but there's, there's even more than that. Um, but it, it's getting a little bit too complex. Uh, oh, but I will say this, but there's other groups also <laughs> involved in Indigenous governance, right? So you may come across what are called tribal councils. In Nova Scotia, you might have heard of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq or the Union of Nova Scotia Indians. These are groups that tend to work with communities. They're older kind of organizations that have created in the 60s and currently sort of provide a service delivery model, uh, sort of a joint service delivery model for different communities. Um, then you have advocacy organizations who are also part of this mix. So beyond the different structures I've told you about, you get organizations like the Assembly of First Nations, um, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, 
um, which, who have also uh, locals uh, or regional groups like the Native Council of Nova Scotia. So there's, 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 these are different advocacy groups that represent different interests. So Assembly of First Nations represents First Nations interests. Uh, the Congress represents officer, uh, non-status. Um, the Atlantic Policy Congress represents the interests of the Atlantic First Nation. Native Women's Association. There's all these groups as well, and it really presents a complex picture. Um, but they often sometimes get pulled in by governments as well, as well when they're doing engagement and consultation sessions. But these groups don't actually have decision-making powers. Really, they're more sort of advocacy. But sometimes I think government officials all confuse that with the actual decision-making, the real decision-making bodies. And then you have a variety of groups who are also service providers. So yeah, there has, back to your ke question, Kevin, there's a lot to parse out there. And I think for anyone who's seeing this, maybe for the first time, is like, eek, there's so much, it's so complex. But um, yeah, and, and there's a long history for, to some of those issues. And they def definitely could use a bit more study. Okay, um, in my last few seconds, I'll just give a picture about lawmaking um, with Indigenous communities. So I've sort of given you the picture of governance, but when it actually comes to making laws and, and, and the self-determination issues, um, we're not very far along yet. There are some pieces of legislation um, that do recognize some lawmaking powers. Basically, Canadian law has not progressed so far as to really um, boldly recognize the, the inherent right to self-government, in a nutshell. And the way that our uh, Canadian law recognizes it is they see that the federal government has the ability to delegate lawmaking power to First Nations. And although there are some powers, it's fairly piecemeal at this point. So I've just got up there uh, a few uh, pieces of legislation that do recognize um, some lawmaking power. And depending on the power, there might be a different process through which those laws can get passed. Most of the time, there's always some sort of a control aspect by the federal government while nonetheless delegating some powers. So for example, if a First Nation wants to pass its own land code and have more control over its reserve land, um, under the First Nations Land Management Act, they have to have a referendum and, uh, and vote on it, and 50% of the membership has to vote in favor of it, or I think it's 25% now, but it's to suggest that there are some lawmaking powers out there, and I've got a paper that summarizes that if you're super interested in this, but it's still pretty piecemeal, and is a far cry from sort of a broad recognition of, of rights. Yes? Maybe your education, your 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 um, university should have have courses that actually do teach this, because getting this in 45 minutes is definitely not enough, and it's only barely scratching the surface, right? So I think that you know I, that's right. Like it would it would be extremely daunting, right, to go into it feel like geez. And but I think it's it's the institutions of higher education. You have TRC actually saying that public servants need to know about the history and the right to self-determination and these and so I think this is part of that issue. So I think it's more about like your university should have a course for any of you who think that you're going in the federal public service. You should know this. Yeah. yeah. And this is just like a little scratch. I teach a whole course on this for at, at law school now, Indigenous Governance, and I think we're looking to hire a new chair in Indigenous Governance. So hopefully, very shortly, maybe there will be a a course or maybe even cross-list it with law uh, for you guys to take. And I think that's, I, you know, I, I could say so much more, like this is really a complex area. But yeah, I'll end on the point that jurisdiction-wise it's mostly delegated and, you know, and communities' hands still continue to be significantly tied um, uh, by the federal government. They still exercise a ton of control and the Probably the biggest issue is what we were coming back to what we were talking about an hour ago with Cindy, which is child welfare and other areas of essential services on reserves are still under this self-administration delegated model uh, where actually Indigenous people have really no say uh, in how services on their reserves are going to be provided. Um, 
And there's a whole other issue about issues beyond the reserve that I haven't even touched that, you know, desert merit discussion, because uh, First Nations interests go well beyond the reserve. But anyway, there is just too much to cover in this short period of time. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like you're going to come back next week. Week <laughs> 2.0. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Naomi Metallic for talking. <laughs>